Like, who would you say your, your role models are or your, hmm. your mentors are? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot. Uh, Chris Hewer, who started Social Media Club, is certainly one of them. He came to D.C. in, I believe it was 2004, I want to say 2004, 2005, uh, and, start, and had the first uh, Social Media Club D.C. event. He started the national one. And just seeing um, the authenticity that is demanded by Chris and the others in that movement around social media is really important and something to emulate. Um, without that core value mm -hmm. of authenticity being the key, um, we'd see a lot more nefarious kind of marketing in the social media space. And mind you, we see that, uh, but there would be more without that. So Chris Hewer, um, locally as well, John Bell um, of Ogilvy, you know, he's he's a brilliant man, and I've been to a number of his um, workshops, and early on, and uh, it was really valuable to me, and I learned a lot, and I'm sure I still would learn from John. Um, and I'm looking forward to being at Interact 2008 um, with him as well. So I'll, I'll probably be interviewing him on site. Um, and then um, locally as well, Jeff Livingston is really a smart guy in the space. I'd recommend you give him a call and interview him. Okay. Uh, he started Livingston Communications, which is recently, recently purchased by Social Media Group. Um, so the list goes on. I mean, I've had so many mentors and so many people that um, I love to follow in terms of thought leadership. I mean, learning from your peers is the only way to do it, I think. Mm -hmm. So going back to, to the whole social media, uh, can it be used by all businesses Is it, or is it just uh, industry specific? I think 100% it can be used by all businesses. Um, you know, the simplest form of social media is a blog, or at least the most, I shouldn't say the simplest, the most common thing you find or the uh -huh. first thing on the tip of people's minds or tongues. Um, and I think that blogging probably has an application for not only any given business, but every, every kind of human being. Um, when you start to engage in content creation like that, um, which is public to the world, which it requires people or at least invites them to comment and interact with it, you start to think in a different way. Um, so even if you're a law firm, uh, which may be considered a real conservative kind of category, um, if you start to blog personally, whether you do it for your own name or blog about your cat or something, you're going to start to understand how that might be relevant for moving your business forward. Um, there, there might be a category here or there that's totally irrelevant for uh, maybe like uranium miners or something. <laughs> I don't know. But for the most part, yeah, I think there are social media tactics and strategies that are relevant for almost every single category. Okay. And has social media kind of replaced online advertising and email marketing? I mean, you, at one point there was, there's websites everyone wanted a website then they moved into email marketing and then they moved into yeah. online advertising you know went from mm -hmm. the from the website to contemporary to now new new media types web 2.0 it, yeah. is it I think 100% um, you know I, I had done this talk uh, on I think it was probably the targeting uh, your constituents using the social graph okay and I showed a comparison between the page views that the major publishers like the WSJ and the Washington Post and the New York Times we're having versus the page views of things like YouTube being a you know social media hub, um, and you could see a decline in the page views of the major publishers and the increase dramatically um, in the page views for the social media hubs. Um, what that means is that online media planning and buying potentially shifting as well at the same time because publishers sell impressions mm -hmm. that's online media, right? Um, and they're probably also selling their email lists at an incredibly high CPM yep. in the hundreds of dollar CPM range, uh, 200, 300 sometimes, depending on the list. Um, and social media, from a marketer's budget perspective, has become incredibly important. Uh, they're starting to allocate funds for social media strategies that um, are really still brand new, which is really interesting. And brand new being about you know year and two years old. Uh, things are coming out daily, which are important for marketers to leverage. Um, some of those things that are pulling money from online media budgets and email marketing budgets are the things like the creation of social applications. So, you know, maybe I want to build a Facebook application because my brand sells to a teenage and a 20-something audience that are heavy users of Facebook. Um, well, where do I get that $50,000 or $25,000, whatever that, that app costs to build? Um, I pull it from somewhere. Right? And especially in a lean economy that we're facing, people's budgets are not expanding. Mm -hmm. That comes from somewhere. Um, it's more than likely coming from a traditional budget than it is from an interactive budget, because the interactive space is still incredibly important in all areas, what I call the interactive universe. I mean, that whole space, I think we just timed out, or at least the, no, no we just, we're back. <laughs> the screen went dark. Uh, so yeah. Okay. And 
I guess del let's delve into that interactive universe. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the greatest fad that everybody's talking about right now is microblogging. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's another buzzword, mm -hmm. but um, you talk about clerk, pounds, sure. Twitter, sure. I mean, those type of things. But what exactly is microblogging? Microblogging is just the ability to publish bite-sized content to the web incredibly easy. And not just to the web, because if you use something like Twitter um, or Brightcut or a number of things, um, that'll post up to people's mobile phones and, and all the rest. And um, I, I mean, the web now is the iPhone. The yep. web now is my Blackberry. I mean, I spend probably two and a half hours a day reading mobile websites. Hmm. You know, that's something that's become incredibly uh, commonplace in the next few years. Maybe. You know, being a total dork that I am, I'm a little more ahead of that curve, and it's sort of my job to be. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, I'd absolutely uh, first first thing you should do, especially with something like microblogging, and with every social media tactic, is um, sort of listen to and watch that environment, right? Yeah. So don't just like jump into a platform like Twitter or something, just start writing anything and everything. Um, look at it and see how people actually are crafting content and interacting with one another, that's going to give you a clue to how that community works and how they're used to talking to one another and how you can provide value and relevancy in an authentic way in that place. But you're talking about defining the content for, mm -hmm. like, say, take Twitter, for example, mm -hmm. because that's what ev and I know that Jeremiah, um, on, on his blog, he posted, like, the brands that are on, that are on yeah. Twitter, um, like, one being, like, JetBlue. And sure. And I believe uh, Jeff Livingston had some issues with with Jeff JetBlue uh, on Twitter. Um, but if it's more of a PR, is it more of a PR or is it more marketing? Or how do you how do you how do you code to your to your marketing department? You're asking about a specific Twitter strategy for brands. Well, well, be, well, not not really that. But if I'm this guy in the company that, that says, oh, I found this new thing about Twitter. I'm on it, you know, nonstop. Mm -hmm. I'm posting things about, you know, oh, I, I just went and saw the dark. I saw Dark sure. Knight, or you know, there's a there's an accident down in, in Arlington or, or whatever. And then I figured, oh, it has value to me as an individual. What possibilities are there to the business? And I go to my marketing mm -hmm. and PR departments, and they pretty mm -hmm. much just shrug it off. Mm -hmm. how, how can we challenge them to to to, mm -hmm. to have them in, be engaged and and not shrug it off as simply, okay. If we have it, it will just be a PR device that says, "Yeah, it goes back to I think my answer around creating committees for learning. Uh -huh. um, if that committee and those people who may be naysayers reflexively, and there are a lot of reflexive no people in life. I've never been one of those, and I don't like to hang out with those kind of people. Uh -huh. I don't like to have them as clients. I don't like to have them as friends. I like people that are like, yeah, that's interesting. Let's talk more about it. Not just like, no, I don't have time. That's not as interesting. Um, if they learn about what this thing is on a personal level, they'll start to say, oh yeah, you know what? you're right we actually could use this for our brand somehow and I'm not necessarily advocating using um, social communities for marketing I think that that's um, increasingly becoming overdone uh, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's good for the users in general it'll it'll become social spam and we see some of that already um, Twitter specifically I mean people ask me oh you know we want a brand strategy we want a strategy for our brand to use Twitter um, I say in the first and foremost Twitter's for people so um, maybe the most relevant or the only relevant or there's a number of relevant things that you can do but the most relevant thing is to have your community manager be your your Twitter person your Twitter profile uh -huh. like Comcast cares is probably the best example and Frank Ellison is the guy he's a human being it's not Comcast pumping out micro blogging content just to sell cable packages it's yeah. a human being who has taken on the role to be the community manager uh, to be that voice and someone that you can talk to because for so long brands have just been this monolithic thing it's a big logo in a building and how do you speak speak truth to power right yeah um, and the social media tools have enabled us to to do that which is really important so let me throw you throw you a little challenge right here off the top of your head take for example washington dc mm -hmm. um they they want to be engaged in social media sure um, I mean, they have website. They do email marketing. They do the, yeah. pretty much a lot of stuff, and but they want to be more engaged with their users. And you were ju you were just talking about uh, not making it to avoid doing being uh, marketing have marketing speak in there uh, and more PR type of stuff. Um, and and I guess how how Robert Robert Scovel and Shell Israel said in Naked Conversations to be be, be be authentic. And that's probably one key thing that 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 I take away yep. from doing social media is you gotta be authentic with anything that you're mm -hmm. doing. Uh, you can't just say, oh, make up fictitious people because people are gonna find out and then you're, you're really gonna Last be screwed. Uh, but for like a city or, or a brand, um, be going on 
Facebook or, or Twitter, and I guess we're talking about uh, microblogging as it is, mm -hmm. how can they be engaged to their audience? Like whether it's a, their yeah, average it's, it's Joe. It's really not, um, it's not that difficult. Um, you know, you guys have created, and when I say you guys, I mean the Washington Convention Tourism Corporation and Kenneth specifically has created the Facebook page for um, Washington.org, which is the body that's responsible for branding Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. as a tourist destination. Um, I find that to be very valuable. And having you guys post the events that are happening in D.C., that are D.C. events, whether that be, um, you know, the Fourth of July fireworks or that's um, the Cherry Blossom Festival, yep. that is the authority. As, as far as I know, that's the right date and that's the right time and this is the right link to go to. Otherwise, I cobble that together from places, but it's really good to have an authority there. Um, the fact that there are so many smart people in this city mm -hmm. um, that are in love with Washington, D.C. is an incredible value that you guys can tap. So if you're asking me on the spot, one of the strategies that I would employ, it would be to find 40 and 50 and 60 of those people who are really passionate to create content about the city and use them as your bloggers. Okay. And they are your brand ambassadors. And you find you know, buckets of them in each of the specific demographic categories that engage with the Washington.org brand. You've got the families and you've got the urban pioneers and you've got all those individuals that act differently and find content differently and, and are interested in different things and have people blog, people like them blog for them and you create those little content silos. That's, that's not, that that difficult to do yeah it may be difficult to get through bureaucracy yeah. um, which every organization has an issue with there's unless you're really really small um, so you can do that and I guess you, you made a you jumped right into to Facebook but how powerful is it in in our, our marketers or PR people or anybody who's in social marketing are they undervaluing it are they are, are they underestimating the power of it some are and some aren't um, those who aren't engaged in, you're asking specifically about Facebook? Yeah, just specifically um, Facebook. Those who aren't engaged in using Facebook as a marketing tool in some way or another that are in the marketing business, I can't even, I don't even understand that personally. Like, how can you not? It's potentially the most um, important marketing innovation that we've seen. It, and I don't even want to call it a marketing innovation because primarily it's a community, but it's, it's one of the most important methods um, in places that marketers can look to find their audiences. Um, now, I'm speaking from, there's a truck passing us, we're gonna have to hold for a sec. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what was I saying? Oh, we're talking about, we were talking about Facebook and, and, and how powerful uh, was. It. Oh, well, you know, I've been speaking primarily from like a, uh, you know, a brand perspective in the sense that like I have something to sell you, I've got a widget or a service, yep. but Facebook's also incredibly important for personal branding. And okay. Personal branding is a whole other conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I find that Facebook, since it's Peter Corbett in there, uh, to be really important for my, my personal brand. I'm very conscious of all the content that streams through my newsfeed and everything yeah. else. Okay. And, and since, you, since you focus a lot of your efforts um, on the social media, uh, what are your insights, and I guess this goes back to being authentic, but, um, but if people create their social profiles, they company X decides, okay, I want to be on Facebook and I just create a profile mm -hmm. for my brand or I create a fan page for my brand or I go on Twitter, I create, create the account. So at least I have, I, I keep the account if three, na three years down the road, I decide to come back and actually actively engage my users in these, in these applications. Is it enough just to sit, just to create it and leave it and, and watch it grow? Or do you need to, it, do, does there need to be somebody there that always that's always there? Yeah, um, without being cliche, I mean, a brand is very much like a seed, you know? So if you just take that seed and you plant it in the dirt, well, you know, it could grow. Maybe it'll pop out of the ground someday and be a beautiful flower, but it's not really gonna unless you nurture it, right? Yeah. So that nurturing, that watering and that sunshine and all the rest, uh, more and more is actually content. Um, so by creating branded content that's valuable to an audience, that thing that is your brand is gonna grow. Um, and maybe I'm thinking about that analogy because I'm launching a service coming up uh, very soon that we call Bloom, which is like cool. content that we create for brands. But um, I think that's really important. And especially in like a very social media driven environment, which is the interactive space right now, it's just overwhelming how important it is. Um, content is the thing that is really consumed and passed around and talked about. It's, that's what it is. Okay. Now, I mean, if you happen to be on, on, the, on the web, whether it's on Monster, 
career builder, Indeed, or, or Craigslist, or anything like that, and you're looking for people, I mean, you might be looking for your next job. I mean, you, you, you used to work in, at, at an interactive agency, um, and now what I'm seeing more and more of are people in agencies that are looking for talent that, that have social media aspects, and, and, and it seems that they want to actively engage in it. Uh, what advice would you give to these interactive agencies to, in terms of how to actively engage in it, whether they hire somebody or mm -hmm. they're doing it themselves? Well, if you're an interactive agency and you're not um, already knee deep in social media and <laughs> just can't stop doing all of it because you have to and your clients love it and you love it and you're passionate about it, you've got a problem, I think. Um, an interactive agency without a social media capability isn't an interactive agency. Um, if you don't have that capability, um, you should partner with someone. Um, I do that. I partner with digital agencies that don't have that capability so that they can flesh out their service offering so that when they talk to their clients, their clients don't say, oh, we really want this thing, and they say, oh, I don't, we don't know how to do it or we don't understand it. That's not something that's going to keep a client on board for very long at all. Um, so, yeah, you either have to hire that skill and bring it in-house or you need to partner with someone who has it. Okay. And people think that executing an online campaign is, is expensive. They're thinking, okay, I want to do mm -hmm. online advertising and I want to do social media or I want to do email marketing, mm -hmm. uh, mobile marketing, widgets, whatever. It, is it true that it can be expensive, or is there a cost, a more cost-effective way of, of simply sure. executing that? It can be very expensive. It can be free. I mean, it depends on how creative you get. I would start with, and if you have lean budgets, because everyone has lean budgets, um, and in this macroeconomic environment um, that's more commonplace, start with everything that's free. Do it all first, and I guarantee you, you'll spend the whole year doing that stuff, and you will see results. Um, before you spend a dollar on, you know, any kind of online media or, or paid search or anything else. Like, do all the free stuff mm -hmm. um, as much as you can. And so, then layer in the paid stuff if you're really that budget conscious. So basically, what you would be waiting, what you'd be using is, it, what it would cost you is basically man hours to, to yeah. manage and execute Absolutely. those programs. Absolutely. Okay. And how would you define mobile marketing? Because I know, you know, I, mean, we, I kind mm -hmm. of alluded to it a little bit more and, and you know, I guess that's, mm -hmm. that goes hand in hand with mobile, with, with micro blogging and hell, everything in, in social media. Uh, how would you, how would you segment my, uh, mobile marketing? There's a lot there. There's even a lot there just in that discipline area. Um, SMS is the most widely adopted mobile technology. Uh -huh. uh, I believe it penetrates 95% of handsets. So you get text messages, you get opt-in to text messaging campaigns, getting branded content from um, campaigns and WAP URLs that you can click through to on your, your handset. That's, you know, pretty tried and true and it's been being used for quite some time. Um, Bluetooth, uh, Bluecasting, Bluetooth broadcasting is really interesting. Walking by, you know, a kiosk or a bus shelter or something else and it pings your phone and says, do you want to download this wallpaper or download this video or this, this MP3? Um, I think that's really sexy. I really like that. Okay. Um, especially because it, it merges the two first two core areas of what I do, which is interactive strategy and experiential marketing. So how do you intercept a human being in their daily life and provide that digital thing that is interesting to them and valuable? Um, then you go down into what I think the iPhone really kicking the door open for it, um, which is applications. I mean, what yeah. do you use on your phone to interact with the rest of the world? I have a Blackberry. I've got Google Talk on there. I've got um, Facebook as an application. Uh -huh. I used to have Twitter integrated directly with Google Talk so I could um, have a live streaming chat right there, but Twitter's I am broke, which <laughs> makes me really sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I think the application ecology uh, okay. is really blossoming very heavily, obviously, on the, on the iPhone platform. Um, Blackberry much slower. I happen to be a Blackberry user. It's just, um, I like to say we're, we're power users. We don't... Nothing wrong with Blackberry. Uh, Nothing wrong with no, Blackberry. No, teach his own. <laughs> well, actually, I give a talk um, at Media Future Now recently on what's called the mobile me, right? I put myself uh, in the mindset of mobile users and showed people things that they do. Um, and I, I said the key thing to understand is mobile is a very personal experience. I mean, you spend probably 12 to 18 hours a day with that device and everyone uses it very differently. Yeah. So when you're conceiving your, your conceptualizing your campaigns, you need to understand that. Uh, yeah. Not everyone uses them the same. Okay. Um, well, 
In terms of like mobile campaigns, could you, I mean, it seems like you have a great deal of experience and in, 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 in great deal of knowledge in mobile campaigns. Have you done, have you created any yourself, whether mm -hmm. in, in, in your current capacity as a CEO or in your, in your previous experience at Blattner? Mm -hmm. Or actually, yeah, Google I want to talk about a really fun one. Uh, this is going back to my, my former agency days, and it's a local brand, which you might be aware of, Woolly Mammoth Theater. Uh, they had a, a show coming up called Dead Man's Cell Phone, uh -huh. uh, which is about a guy dies, woman finds his cell phone, and starts to interact with his family through that. Um, and so we said, this needs to be a mobile campaign. I mean, if it's not a mobile campaign, I don't know what it is. So what we did was we basically built almost like what would be Utters today, yep. where you could call into a platform and uh, tell the world basically something that you overheard and record that MP3 and then we posted it up to you know, a content management platform that people could come and hear that MP3 and rate it and all the rest. Um, the engagement metrics were massive. Um, the, and we tracked everything down to ticket sales. What we learned was the people who engaged in this whole story and went down the rabbit hole, so to speak, were something like 40% more likely um, to purchase a ticket than the people that didn't. And we called that, we kind of, you have to create new metrics sometimes yeah. for some of this stuff. And we had like shallow engagement versus deep engagement. And shallow engagement was someone who just asked for the discount code for the ticket. The deep engagement was the, some, the person that actually called in and left the voicemail and then got a different discount code after they completed that action. Um, the people who got the discount code didn't convert as much. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, oh, well, they wanted the coupon. Doesn't that mean they want to buy something? But they, they didn't buy into the story enough. They weren't invested in that campaign and in that show. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Okay. And what are widgets? I mean, you hear that, you hear that term being thrown sure. about like oh, in marketing speak it's a widget is sure. nothing you don't ha you can't really describe but in, in in online what is a widget widget is content that's portable so you, you can you can just take it and, and, uh, and apply it to to your Facebook page your, I can your web page. I can complicate my answer if you want widget a widget is content that's portable so, uh, so an example <laughs> is uh, <laughs> So a widget is a little piece of code that maybe it pulls in a photo, uh -huh. right? And it's got, it dis displays the photo and it's got a little branded banner frame around it, but also it's got a little button that says grab me or, or share this. And you click that, it says, oh, I can put this in Facebook, I can put it in MySpace, I can put it on my blog, that without coding necessarily. Yep. So click, punch, boom, it's in Facebook. So you've, you've quote unquote widgetized the web, you've made it broken up into little pieces that can be shared and thrown around all over the place okay. without being a coder. Okay. And I don't know how many people, I mean, there might be a lot of people, or if anybody <laughs> watching that, 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 that doesn't really, hasn't met you yet, um, or hasn't been to any of your events, mm -hmm. but I know that you, you, you put together some really great events here in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought together uh, Robert Scoble um, to D.C., um, I didn't really. Well, I didn't bring him. I well, showed you, up you had a, you a, a soiree. You had a nice, uh, nice video uh, talking yeah. about social yeah. media and politics. And then uh, Sarah Lacey happened to come into mm -hmm. town for her user-generated mm -hmm. book tour for her for her great book. Um, and and you know you you put together a great event for that. And I know you're putting together another one mm -hmm. trying to combine the DC with the Northern Virginia mm -hmm. tech community. Um, so uh, you know everybody's really happy about that. The question I have that here is why is DC, how, why is DC becoming a hub for the next Silicon Valley outside of Silicon Valley? Um, it's really a lot of things. Um, primarily, I mean, you know, I've been here for about four years and started doing community organizing uh, sort of right when I got here. And I've already, I've always done that. Yep. You know, I've always been a person that brings people together. That's just how I'm built. Um, and when we first started doing it, and there's a lot of us, you know, Frank Gruber or Nick O'Neill or Justin Thorpe or Jackson Wilkinson or... Um, any number of individuals, a lot of really talented, really passionate people that have built the community here. When, when a lot of us started doing this, there were 10 and 15 and 20 people that would come to events um, because they were really interested in the topic and they were very um, you know, forward thinking, whether that was a social media club or a mobile Monday or um, you know, a bar camp or whatever that thing was. Um, over the past three or four years, that community has really started to gel. Mm -hmm. um, people have gotten to meet each other. They're more well connected in, in every way than they ever had been before. So we started to reach a point where you do an event and 100 people come and 200 people come. And then layering on top social media technologies um, enables the broadcast of events and things and content that happens much more easily. So I can let a network of 15 or 1,500 or 2,000 people in greater Washington, D.C. area know about something that I'm creating for free and immediately. Um, I don't know how you would have done that 10 years ago, 
right? Yeah. Or, f or four years ago, you still could do it. It wasn't as, the group wasn't uh, tightly knit as much. So in some, it's the human beings who, who've invested a lot of time in bringing everyone together. Um, and then the confluence with technology enabling um, people to more freely get together. Okay. And, and I just have a, a few more a few more questions here, but uh, I mean, you've been to South by Southwest uh, and, and you're heading up to uh, which Inbound one? Inbound Marketing Summit in yeah. Boston I'm speaking at. And you're, and you're, you're going to be speaking with, with Seth Godin uh, uh, as well and a bunch of other people. Um, what, what importance do you place on going to these types of conferences for, for marketers, whether or not it's for their job specifically, whether if they're dealing with It's the most with valuable online. thing that you can do in any kind of professional development um, you can imagine. I mean, the, the networking is probably the most important part. Uh, I learn more from human beings, like in my conversations with them, than I do from maybe a speaker standing on stage. Uh -huh. um, I, might, I might not be the best case, uh, case study at this point because I, you know, I know a lot about the space, so maybe I don't get as much value out of the, the talks that happen, but I, I certainly do get a lot of value out of many of them. Um, so meeting new people um, and understanding their backgrounds and what they do and being able to leverage them and their talent for things that I do is so amazing. And they use me for the same thing. So that, go to everything you can afford to go to. Um, and if you can't afford to go, think about a way that you can go for free and get creative. And just say, I will empty the garbage cans. I don't care. <laughs> I need to go to this, yep. this, this conference. And it's $2,000. I will wash your car. I will, you know, like, <laughs> just get there. Here's my car keys. Just get there. Just get there. Okay. Especially South by Southwest. Ah, yes. Everyone yeah. and anyone who's in the interactive space, if you haven't been, you have to go. Your whole world will just, your mind will blow up. It's amazing. And I guess the last question that I have is, where do you see the trend of interactive marketing going in the next five to ten years? Wow. <clears throat> um, you're going to see a lot more crossover between the physical and the digital. Um, right now, you know, sit in a restaurant and look around when you're sitting with your friends and think about what is digital. It's primarily only the mobile phone in your pocket, right? Um, in the future, ten, five years from now, easily, I mean, everything is going to be infused with some digital component, whether they've been tagged with RFID chips or the, or the table is built on Microsoft service and you can order directly by tapping on the table and all that. Your whole physical world will be more digitally infused. Mm -hmm. That has applications far beyond marketing. Right, That's, that has anthropological ramifications for how we as human beings experience the world on a daily basis. And we will change as people because of that. Um, change for the good or the bad, I don't know. You know, um, It's probably not for me to judge as long as uh, we're still happy and healthy. Not that the world is that happy and healthy anyway. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll leave that to the guy in the big white house. But uh, Yes. All right, well thank you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Peter. I really appreciate it. I mean, it, I guess at this part in, my, in the segment, what I, I guess I would probably like to try and do is, I, do, you, do you want to do a 30 second plug on, on no, anything No, I'll offer that this doing? up. If anyone has actually made it through this entire interview and listened to me blab on and on and on, <laughs> I owe you lunch or I owe you drinks or something. <laughs> That's impressive, so take me up on that. Um, and then also there are a couple things happening in September that you might like. Um, Twin Tech 2, Kenneth was referring to, is happening on September 18th and should be just a massive party. There's yeah. 575 people RSVP'd. We're a month out. There'll be a thousand easily, most likely. And then uh, the biggest open bar, yeah. sponsored by lots of awesome emerging uh, startups and established companies, bringing and together the the veterans and the technology community mm -hmm. with this kind of new media person, which I call collectively like the Wired Ones, which some people have heard me say, and I, I love that thought. Like these are just <laughs> people that are so wired and passionate. Um, that's it. Cool. Well, you can catch Peter online. He's at uh, iStrategyLabs.com or on Twitter at Corbett3000. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kenneth. Bye.